a political cartoon of Governor Snyder on the cover of the Detroit Metro Times by Sean Beery. Now, I'm going to talk about humor, humor magazines, political cartoons, uh, and we'll throw a lot of names at you, which is my style, not because you need to know them all this summer, but because I want you to hear them if only for the first time and then become aware of them the rest of your life and start learning who drew what as you see them and maybe even write about them for an art history class or something. Uh, that's my end goal here. So, the beginning of printmaking during religious wars 300 or so years ago, you started getting all sorts of insulting representations of the other side, other faith. Uh, about 200 years ago, a lot of political cartoons. In England, there was a politician named Fox, so they'd always draw him as a little fox. Uh, Hogarth, Rowlandson, Gilray, a lot of great uh, satirical, outrageous uh, artists that began a tradition still going on in Britain. They had the first humor magazine, Punch, in the 19th century, Victorian era. Uh, the, about the time of the Civil War in the United States, America had the great cartoonist Thomas Nast uh, in Harper's Weekly magazine. There had been uh, cartoonists beforehand, but he's the one who created the elephant to represent the Republican Party. He's the one who created the donkey to represent the Democrats. Uh, there was a big fat politician uh, named Tweed in New York City uh, who he caricatured as a big fat bag of money. And Tweed said, I don't care what they write about me. Most of my supporters can't read, but it's those damn drawings. Uh, so uh, the power of the cartoon was being acknowledged by this guy. He started getting humor magazines springing up, sometimes in colleges. Uh, the Harvard Lampoon uh, was an early one. Dartmouth Jack-O-Lantern that I worked for in college, so did Dr. Seuss, but long before my time. And downstate you can still pick up the Gargoyle in Ann Arbor, uh, University of Michigan's uh, humor magazine. At one point, there were three different humor publications, including a local version of The Onion uh, a few years ago that you could pick up walking around the University of Michigan campus. So uh, we need one, we need a humor magazine at SBSU. Uh, so uh, there were ones in the 19th century the one called Life, that was a predecessor of the picture magazine Life, uh, but one called Puck, uh, and there were caricatures. Uh, in England, Max Beerbaum did caricatures of celebrities and of uh, literary figures a lot. Uh, and those were uh, popular. You started getting the big head cartoon where somebody's face would be taking up much of, uh, perched upon a tiny body uh, in the 19th century. And then um, in Mexico, Jose Guadalupe Posada commented on political events using skeletons. In Germany, uh, there was a humor magazine, Simplicissimus, that Heinrich Clay did these great weird drawings of uh, animals and people uh, using a very scratchy pen. Uh, we have a good book on him in the Zano Library. And George Grosch. In the 
1920s in Germany when times were very hard. He was doing very intense uh, political drawings uh, that were published. So uh, there's this whole tradition of uh, telling truth to power using the power of the pen and exaggeration, the cartoon, the masses was a radical journal in the United States. And it um, sometimes used representation to criticize wealthy churches that they didn't think were doing enough for society, uh, having the church turning away the poor beggar Jesus Christ, uh, something. So a lot of very um, strong criticism of things going on done with cartoons. And that uh, tradition continues. 1950s, there was a guy, Herblock. His real name was Herbert Block, but he shortened it to Herblock. And he created a lot of images, um, I think, for about 50 years. Uh, during time, people worried about the atomic bomb. He had this character like Mr. A-Bomb who was dominating the whole scene and all the international negotiations. He came up with a character, John Q. Public, who was supposed to be the average man to, uh, not Joe Sixpack, um, but another representation of middle class character, middle class, an average American, if there is such a thing. So uh, get a look at her block. cartoons as well. Uh, very influential. A lot of the uh, cartoons you see in newspapers are in his tradition, his style, uh, to this day. So, um, then, humor magazines. Um, I'll, when I talk about horror, I'll lead into the story of why Mad Magazine survived, but very influential, still published. Uh, here's one from my collection that uh, bent the head of little Mike Mosier. Uh, this, is, this reminds me of my art students. Alfred's painting the road black in order to keep the white line. Here it's just students nowadays do things the hardest way as well, but not in my class. Um, Covarubias was a Cuban artist who came to the U.S. and drew for Vanity Fair magazine in the 1930s. A lot of great caricatures. Yeah. See, if we were in the classroom, I'd be shoving all these books across the table at you. Um, but here are a couple actors in some play uh, that appeared uh, in a Freud caricature of uh, the theater that probably accompanied a review of the play they were in. So the New Yorker magazine was also uh, very influential in the development of comics uh, and of cartoons and illustrations. Uh, you owe it to yourself to buy a New Yorker and you know, read the articles because they're good, but also just get a sense of what a New Yorker cartoon is. And you can actually buy collections of those. You might find one uh, at the bookstore of just the cartoons. Sometimes have their collection of cartoons on cats or something if there's a subject you like. But the single panel cartoon. The Adams Family characters began as single panel New Yorker cartoons by Charles Adams about this very eccentric, slightly morbid family. So um, this is a good time to be thinking like a cartoonist uh, and coming up with humorous comments uh, through your economical, well-drawn artwork published publishable uh, to say what you want to say.